Welcome to another uh, vidcast from Zazazu. Uh, this time we're going to talk about what we wish we'd known about making audio games. Just to recap, Zazazu is one of the oldest and most expansive game developers on the Alexa and Google Assistant platforms. We've had the first massively multiplayer game, the first real-time shooter, and we're the first to take monetization seriously long before there were official APIs. Our experiences have been broad and deep, but not always successful. Uh, there are some things that work well in voice, some things that don't. And it's not always clear and straightforward ahead of time which of these your ideas will be. But we'll share all of the joys and the sorrows of the development path and give some advice on how to charter a clear course. So let's first talk a little bit about games. Games are a popular development option for voice assistants. Everybody loves games, right? For people developing on this platform, uh, for personal skills development, they're an engaging topic to pursue. If you're going to learn, you might as well have fun while learning. What better way to have fun than by writing a game? For people doing portfolio pieces to show off to their friends or to impress their colleagues, something that looks good on the resume, uh, it's a lot easier to capture on someone's interest if it's amusing. And for those people looking to make money, Game development is a well-established way to see what can be done on emerging platforms. Since the user base itself is emerging, they too are looking for something to do, and the diversionary nature of games is perfect. At Zazazu, we had some of those reasons, but we had another. This is a new platform with very different limits. Audio apps, in one form or another, have been around since the first automated telephone response system. But a virtual assistant style in a domestic setting is something new. Trying to create a compelling user experience or just working out what could or could not be done has been a major challenge. But people want to play games. So by wrapping up our experiments in design and audio development in the form of a game, we gain easy access to experimental sub I, mean, I mean users. By putting out trials, we can see what works and what does not work and gain valuable insight into our consultancy business and to the development of our own gaming properties and other more mainstream work. The key thing to note here is that you find out what works and what does not work. No one's perfect. There are some ideas that look great on paper or sound awesome when you voice test them, but then get snarled up in reality when you try to implement them or just don't prove that compelling to users. So for this talk, we're not going to try to impress you with how amazingly awesome we are. We're more than happy to talk about that, but we'll save that for another vidcast. Right now, we're going to concentrate on our failures. The time and energy we invested in things that did not work. The hours and gray hair generated for games that no one wants to play. Although cathartic in a sort of a masochistic way, what we really hope to pass on is a number of cautionary tales. By relating vignettes of what didn't work, we can help you not make the same mistakes, or at least give you some iteration time in working out how to do the same things better. Let's get started. Cautionary tale number one, text adventure games. One of the entries I created for the very first Alexa hackathon I attended was a voice port of the classic Colossal Cave Adventure. You know, you're in a maze of twisty patches, it's all alike. You know. This game has been around since the 70s. Anyone else remember the 70s? Uh, and is one of the first things ported to almost any new platform. The interactive nature of it seemed like it would be an ideal thing to convey as a voice application. So I trolled the internet, I found out a portion of it in a language that I liked, even so far as to get permission of the person who wrote it to use it. You know, intellectual property is important and all that sort of thing. Since it was an open input system, it took a little effort to work out all the possible correct and incorrect inputs and design an audio model for them and their combinations. But it was a nice challenge rather than being insanely difficult. In short order, I had a demo running and in emulation, which I wrote myself, <laughs> uh, was able to play the game from start to finish. There's even a video of it uh, somewhere out there on YouTube. I'll, I'll link to it in the comments. Uh, I went into the hackathon with visions of doors that would open. Other text adventure games waiting to be ported to this new platform. A wealth of opportunity for easy pickings. At the hackathon, I got to try it out on an actual device. And I learned it was terrible. Problem one. 
the game was way too verbose. On the screen, there are lovely passages of detailed descriptions of the subterranean realm you're exploring. Some are just descriptive, others have clues to playing the game. But they were all much longer than was comfortable to hear in a computer-generated voice. The game itself recognized this and would abbreviate the description after you had visited a place three times. But that still left an interminable amount of verbiage. What works well on a screen does not necessarily work well in voice. On screen, you can skip ahead, reread, or just look for keywords. With voice, you have to listen from start to finish at the pace of the person that is reading it. The lesson learned was that its every word must be relevant in voice. A three sentence response is pushing it. The minimum you need to con the minimum that you need to convey your messages is what you want to aim for. Problem two. The gameplay just wasn't interesting in voice. At the dawn of natural language parsing, much of the endearing fun of the game was finding out the exact language you need to use to trigger an action in the game. With a 0.001 megahertz processor and just over a megabyte of memory, these machines didn't have a lot of space for aliases or sophisticated analysis. What was once an endearing process of learning how to communicate with a machine back in the day ends up being a UX nightmare to the modern audience. The lesson learned there is that voice is sufficiently different that just porting code will very seldom work. You need to redesign from the ground up. Choose your own adventure games have had some moderate popularity on the system, but they are generally composed of content custom to voice rather than ports of successes from other platforms. Cautionary tale number two, post secret. There's a website out there where people are encouraged to send anonymous postcards with their deepest, darkest secrets. Every week they collate these, create these, and present a selection of them out on the website for everybody to ooh and awe over and to sympathize with, etc., etc. In the audio space, the vendors, Amazon and Google, have done a good job of providing the users of these audio assistants with anonymity. It's really fine to find out who exactly is behind this. So that's a great thing uh, for this sort of app. So we thought it's like, okay, well, maybe we could do sort of like a same sort of thing as Post Secret, where people can use their assistant as sort of a confidant or therapist and share anonymously how they feel, and other people can respond to that. You know, they could shout out into the void and hear the echoes. The problem is this. Voice assistants are not dictation machines. They can be pretty good at understanding speech. 90% accurate, 95% accurate on a good day. But think about it. 90% accurate means one word in 10 is wrong. That's about one word per sentence. And there's no way to edit. You say it, your assistant can say it back to check. You see the mistake. But you have no cursor or highlight. All you can do is reject the transcription and say it again. And the usual annoying outcome of this is that the fault is not in your pronunciation, but in this assistant's understanding. So it makes exactly the same mistake. If your great idea involves open recognition of anything more than a short phrase, especially if someone other than the speaker is expected to understand it, step away from the keyboard and repeat voice assistants are not dictation machines. No matter how amazing you think it would be, just don't do it. It's hard. Right? There's so many great ideas that would work if this worked. But we've made this mistake several times. Every year we think, oh, maybe the technology is better now and code something up. And no, voice assistants are not dictation machines. I'm considering the tattooed, maybe like on my forehead. Cautionary tale number four. User acquisition is hard. Before we could get very far in the execution of our game quartet plan for Starlanes, we had another problem. The Alexa skill store at this point had reached 1,000 applications. Uh, that's a big hallmark in the time. Uh, this was too many for users to stumble across our game randomly. The ranking system favored applications with a small number of universally high scores, and there wasn't a big enough audio assistant install base for word to spread organically. As our game grew less discoverable, we started to experience a drop-off in new users. We had just begun monetization of the skill, selling Starlane's t-shirts via merch with Amazon. We had a budget, albeit small, so we decided we would start advertising to make up for the shortfall. Google AdWords were well-positioned for us, 
We felt their keyword-driven approach would allow us to narrow in on a segment that was not yet overexploited or overpriced. We could also tie our ad buy to our budget. It was approachable and easy to use. We set up a few ads and sat back to watch the users roll in. But they didn't. We had a pretty good conversion rate. Uh, higher than we were led to believe for this sort of advertising. Unfortunately, the overall numbers were very low. We never even reached our budget numbers. Very few people used Google search to find audio applications. And there weren't any affiliated sites with the right user base for Google to match up with what we wanted. In addition to that, for the ads we did serve up, we were unable to measure any users coming from them. We tried other advertising, one at a time, measured the results. Nothing moved the needle above background noise. Fortuitously, we did manage, once or twice, to have a skill listed in the Alexa Companion app sliders and the Amazon Weekly Circular. These did provide a measurable boost to the new users coming in, but once the promotion stopped, so did the new users. And since Amazon do not currently allow you to buy advertising these slots, such promotion was only available at Amazon's discretion. The lesson we learned was, well, this is really hard. We have not yet found a good solution to the user acquisition problem, and it's one of the two main barriers we face today to producing successful games on these platforms. Cautionary tale number five. User retention is also hard. There's nothing more soul-destroying than to see a vibrant and exciting base of users slowly slip away through your fingers. After an initial release or a fortuitous promotion event, or Christmas, can boost your users. It's it's great to see them and make plans for monetizing or, in cooperative games, see the interplay boost engagement in your game. But once the event passes and the number of new users goes down, the number of ongoing users slowly decays over time. People come to games, they play them for a while, and then they move on. That's part of game development, and the aim is to create enough content or engagement to keep them on the game long enough to make a return from them, in whatever form you seek. Uh, but for voice apps, the decay curve is very steep. Looking into this, we found a number of structural problems. You can't create a bookmark for voice app. You can't put an icon on the desktop. The platforms now offer ways to create a URL that links to the web directory for the game. But as with advertising, browsing the web is so far removed from using the virtual assistant that the transfer rate is very low. There are ways to get a user's email address and send a we haven't seen you in a while reminder, but these involve an upfront opt-in that is off-putting and reduces your already low acquisition rate. And even more than with the web, the transfer rate from an email to a voice invocation is very low. The lesson we've learned here is that this too is very hard and represents the second main barrier to the platform. The only solution we found is to create games so compelling and engaging that they become one of the user's sole reason for using the device. And that brings us to our next problem. This is not a hardcore gaming platform. Uh, we gave a talk in Dublin on voice design. It was preceded by a talk on UX for games. And the gentleman there had a very interesting level of separating different types of games. Casual games, by his definition, were games that users played between things to kill time and to you know, had a main play loop of about 30 seconds. Mid-core games were ones that have about a 20-minute game loop and that players fit into their schedules. Hardcore games had a one to two hour play loop and the players fit their schedules around their gameplay. So, in an effort to combat user retention, we created the most engaging game we could muster, Six Swords. This is basically D&D &D via voice. There are hundreds of monsters, nearly 100 items, several infinite dimensions of procedurally generated landscape, three dimensions of curated landscapes, two of which actually allow users to explore real-world geographies, Ireland and Iceland, there were winding dungeons to delve, sprawling cities to chop in, ruined temples to cleanse, gods to curry favor with, quests to go on, and so on and so forth. It is the richest and broadest voice application available on any of the platforms today. And it attracted some very dedicated users. The stats we collected delighted us. One user played it eight hours a day. Eight hours. After a few months, we had over 40 users who passed the 20 minute a month mark, and a dozen who played it over 100 hours. This was great. We had what we wanted, an app that was compelling enough to make someone sit and talk to a computer for hours at a time. It was a breakthrough to justify this as a gaming platform. Sure, not everyone will rise to this level, but even if only 2% of those who tried it played it for 10 hours, that was enough to monetize and make a return to put up against the development effort. But the user base still remained very low, very dedicated, but very low. 
We had a forum for the game and participated in threads about it in other gaming forums. We were able to contact and talk with a number of our super dedicated players, and we discovered one common fact. They were blind. They were all blind. Or at least visually impaired. All of them. Every single one of our extremely dedicated players was blind, without any exception we ever found. They loved what we were doing. No one else was creating substantive gaming experiences that they could participate in on an equal footing with sighted players. It was fun, it was engaging, and it was as challenging like any good game should be. But it was also accessible, something they could play. And yes, this was heartwarming. The fact that people were spending hundreds of hours with our content and that we were giving joy to people who had previously only really been able to hear about others talk about this sort of thing and not participate felt very fulfilling. But it also taught us an important lesson. Blind gamers loved these games because they had no other choice. Sighted gamers had all of the industry's games to choose from. And, given the choice, they didn't choose ours. Why spend your game time talking to a computer when you could also be mesmerized by stunning visuals? If you could choose one or the other, you'd always choose the other. So, it's just not really a hardcore gaming platform. We can't compete with anything that has an interactive screen. What about casual games and mid-core games? Well, let's see. Another incentive we had to writing hardcore games was that it was, well, hard. A friend of mine created a voice app, not a game, that did stunningly well. It was a simple idea that exploited the gap that Amazon and Google hadn't filled in their intrinsic features. However, it also wasn't very hard to write, which meant that once his success became clear, everyone and their brother copied what he had done ad nauseum. So we developed the motto, do hard things. The harder it was to write, the harder it would be to copy. And, well, while that turned out to be true, we also discovered that such immersive experiences did not have mainstream appeal. Casual and mid-core games certainly stand a better chance than hardcore games. They definitely require less investment. The downside is that they are much easier to copy. Audio apps are such a low-fidelity medium that you have less bells and whistles to add in order to make yourself unique. Because of the learning and discovery curves, minimalist apps are the easiest for users to engage with. And, unfortunately, minimalist apps are not that hard to backwards engineer. Also running against the shorter play cycle apps is that you have less time to build engagement. Massive engagement was the only solution we found to user retention. Without that, it once again becomes a problem. We've learned a few tricks over time. Putting in leaderboards gives an incentive to players and adds a notch that many copycats find hard to emulate. Trying to hook a user with a subscription model or premium content gives them an incentive to come back to your app. But it also gives them an incentive to use a non-charging app that is almost as good as yours. In conclusion, how was Treaty depressing, right? Doom and gloom. Well, that's been our objective. <laughs> would you rather hear about how ideas that sound great can go bad from me, or would you rather learn it after investing a huge effort? I'm not telling you these stories here to try to persuade you not to develop games for voice platforms. What I'm really trying to do is to give you focus. Look at your ideas and really think about them critically. If they fall into one of the patterns that I've described, have a long, hard think about it. What distinguishes your effort from these efforts? Before you proceed, you need a good answer to that. These are cautionary tales, but they aren't saying don't go. They're saying don't go this way. This is an emerging field, but not in the way that most people think. Most technologies are measured by the rapidity in which new disruptive features are released. By that measure, voice apps have been pretty stable. We're at the plateau level, technology-wise. Where we are still thrashing around in the dark is at the design and marketing level. We have to get past what can we do and focus on what should we do. Technology is not going to get us over the finish line here. There is nothing coming down the technology pipeline that will suddenly solve any of these problems. We have all the tools we're going to have. What we need is imagination. So go out there and be imaginative. Someone listening to this is going to look at all of this stuff that doesn't work and think of something new. And maybe that new something will work. Let us know.